Before you guys sit down, I want to challenge you guys to give 10 people a high five around you so you can actually walk out, walk around, walk around, say hi, say what's up, meet someone new, take a little bit. We got time, we got time. Make sure it's 10. Come on, you got to get 10. Did anybody actually get 10? Anybody get 10? Okay, we got, we got a couple of honest people here. The rest will have an altar call at the end, so it's all good. Um, next, next week it's 20, so we're going we're gonna to get this thing down. Um, I'm so glad that you guys are all here. Um, is there anybody here for their first time at all? Anybody here? What's your name, man? Jesse. Hey, can we give it a warm welcome for Jesse? We're so glad you're here, man. Welcome to G14. Is there anybody else? Okay, um, with that said, please help me welcome our one and only Slavik Mudrak. He's going to be doing an offering. Where is he at? <laughs> Slavik. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> yeah. All right. How you guys doing? You guys doing woo? Yeah. Doing woo? <laughs> uh, this is my first time doing this. Woo! Pretty scary. I don't know how you guys do this. Um, just bear with me. Actually, I have a testimony that I can share, actually, before I do offering. Uh, I did this, I shared it with my, our leaders meeting. Uh, this Wednesday, we were driving, me and my sister and Eva, uh, we were driving down the road, and I guess I got distracted, we were going pretty fast, and there's an intersection about 20 feet ahead of me. And I think, my sister said I was looking down on my phone, changing the song. Uh, and I ran past the, the stop sign and I hit the car going across. And we got hit pretty bad. Uh, we spun, my sister got knocked out, I got a bloody nose on impact um, from the airbag, and then Eva wasn't buckled up. Uh, you know, so, but uh, praise God that you know, no one got hurt. You know, I was a, as an EMT, I've seen a lot of, a lot of really similar incidents where it wasn't like ours, you know. Uh, we got out lucky. I just had a bloody nose and a small concussion, but I've seen people with, you know, losing lives, um, broken limbs, all that. So, you know, praise God, they put, they put my nose back in place uh, without any, like, medication, just, like, manhandled me. So, yeah, it's almost, almost perfect. So praise God for that. Um, So uh, recently, I don't know how you can segue to, from that to offering, but uh, recently, you know, my devotionals, I've been going through the Gospels of the Bible, and, um, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this past few weeks, and what I've really noticed in, like, my broad reading of it, uh, the theme faith kept, kept popping up throughout the Gospels. You know, Jesus always talks about it. He always encourages his disciples to to practice their faith, to work out their faith, you know, take, take risks. Um, he even, uh, he was just amazed by people who had faith. You know, you look at the story of the centurion who uh, just said, you know, you don't have to come to my house to heal my servant. You could just say the word and you'll be healed. And Jesus actually said, I've never seen such faith in all of Israel. And you look at the story of the woman with a bleeding condition. Uh, you know, she just said, if I just touch Jesus, Jesus' garment, I'll be healed, and Jesus noticed that. He felt the power leave him as soon as, as soon as she touched the garment, and he said, by your faith, you are healed. So faith was really huge for Jesus. He loved to see that. And, uh, you know, we questioned, you know, what is faith? You know, in my life, I've always kind of been like a reasonable person, uh, just trying to think of the reality of things. Faith, faith asks you to believe in something you don't see. You look at the definition, and I think the best, the best definition in the Bible is, um, what is it? 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So substance, something tangible, something real, and evidence that you can't see. So it's basically saying, uh, believe in something you can't see. You know, blindly trust in me, blindly follow me. That's a big, you know, that's a big statement. Um, let's see, another really good one I really like, what really caught my attention uh, about faith is, if you go to Hebrews, um, what is it? How am I doing, guys? Doing good? All right. Eleven uh, eight. It says, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place that he was receive, to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So just that verse, went out, he was called, and went out not knowing where he was going. That's the definition of faith for me. I mean, that really makes sense for me. You know, uh, he had no idea where he was going. He went out not knowing anything. You know, a lot of times we try to plan our steps for me, I'm always kind of like a control freak, you know. I think about my future. I think about what career I should do or, uh, you know, what path I should take. But, you know, it's good to plan. But God says, uh, a man makes his plan, but God directs his footsteps. So faith is all about, you know, letting God take those footsteps. You know, let loose, let go, and let God take control. So um, let's go to Mark, I think it was. And this is I'm just gonna just keep that in mind. The faith. I think it was Mark, eleven forty-two. Actually, I'm in Matthew. Dang it! I can't find it. <laughs> oh man. Okay, I'll just tell you guys a story. Um, the story of the, the widow that gave her offering. So Jesus, look at Jesus' perspective. Uh, he's standing in the temple, and all these people are giving their offering. Many, many sums out of their abundance. So they, have, they don't really have much to lose. And then Jesus sees this old widow, I don't know if she's a widow, but she's a lady, that gave two cents that made a penny. And he said, he said to his disciples, look at this lady Look how much she gave. She has given more than any of these people that have given their large sums. So I don't think Jesus was looking at her, you know, the amount that she gave, but she, he was clearly looking at the faith that she was giving them out with. So when we give today, let's, it's not about how much we give, the amount, but what's behind it. What's your motive behind what you give? Is there faith? Do you trust in God to provide for you no matter what amount you have? You know, we're... A lot of us are, are going to Mexico, so this is an awesome opportunity for us to really put our faith on the line, really test our faith, so God will, will be able to provide for you. Um, yeah, let's pray, guys. Father, we thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity that you give us to give, Lord, that we can serve others, Lord, and we just pray, Father, that let our faith be strengthened, Lord, through your word, let our faith be strengthened as we give to others, Lord, and we thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity. We pray for every person who has a financial need, who needs a job, Lord, who needs some help financially, Lord, let, I pray that let them have their faith in you, Jesus, and that you would provide. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Uh, Elijah, let's go. Hi guys, um, so I was asked to speak, and I was uh, been really hesitant and resistant um, to come up here, uh, you know, just because uh, I always made up an excuse, you know, or I would kind of look at, you know, what I've done, and I'm like, I have no right, you know, to be before God's people, God's, you know, holy children, and say His word, but. You know, it's not about what I could do or what I could say, but it's about what God's done. You know, God's done in every single one of our lives about how merciful and graceful he is towards us. And, you know, really God has called every single one of us, you, to, you know, give it all up and surrender to God. You know, surrender our will, surrender our desires, 
and God will, you know, he'll bless us. And, you know, that's what I kind of want to focus on is giving it all up to God, surrendering it all to him and allow him to, you know, just work in you because, um, you know, a lot of things have been going on in my life and I, you know, I finally feel and see God as saying, you know, you can choose your path, you can do what you want, you know, but, you know, ultimately you can't be in the world and you can't serve me. You got to be fully devoted to me. You got to fully give up, give up your right. And, you know, that's been my prayer. That's for the, these past, um, these past couple of months. And, um, you know, God is a holy God. He is a righteous God and he is a loving God. And as Christians, as believers in him, we have a responsibility. We have a, you know, we are representatives of Christ, and are we doing that? Are we representing Christ through our, through our daily walk, through our daily life? Are we, are we truly representing him, you know? And, you know, so often I don't see myself doing that. You know, that's why I didn't really want to come up here, but, you know, you got to give it all to God, and you got to surrender your life to God and truly represent him. And, um, you know, in Second Corinthians um, 5.10, you guys want to open that up? You know, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due, what is due for him, for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And it's kind of like a sobering, sobering, you know, um, word, you know, to think that we need to, represent God. We're going to stand before him, you know, and he's going to, he's going to judge him. And a lot of us have a mis, you know, understanding or perception of what grace is, you know. You know, we take it either to one extreme or, or the other, you know, and we say it's okay to fall or it's okay to do this, but without even making an effort or without even trying to read the Bible or pray and just kind of go through our daily lives and whatever happens, happens. And by grace, I'm saved and do what I want. But really, that's not, that's not it. That's wrong. And uh, we just got to understand that and know that God is a righteous God and he expects us to be righteous. He expects us to be holy because he is holy, not by anything that we could do, but by what he's already done. And so he's holy. We have to, you know, represent that and, you know, make certain choices and throughout our lives to reflect that. Um, you know, you know, the past doesn't define us, God does. And in closing, uh, can we open up to James uh, chapter two, verse It says, um, speak and act as though you are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. You know, and as I, as I read that, you know, we're not, we're not being judged by the law. The law isn't going to judge us. We've already been judged, you know. You know, God did that through his son. But why, is he, why do you think he's saying this? You know, to live in a certain way, to act in a certain way as if, as if though you're going to be judged by the law. So he's kind of saying, guys, you need to act a certain way. You need to live a certain way. You need to think a certain way. And, uh, you know, that was just really, really, like, mind-blowing to me and to think that, you know, we got to, there's, there's a way to live and act. And with that, um, yeah, that's all I had to say. Thank you guys for listening. That's what's up. Can we give it up for Elijah again? Amen. Some of the things the guy's been talking about, Elijah and Slavic, I'll be kind of continuing with what I have prepared. Um, can we, uh, you guys on the island over there, you guys want to join? Join us on the mainland? I call this the mainland. You guys are in Hawaii, and I don't like Hawaii. No, I'm kidding. But if you guys want to join us over here, that'd be great, please. 
Some people are confused. It's okay. And those guys, those guys already know. Good job. Okay. Okay. Guys, don't be shy. Let's go. Come on. We love you. There we go. Братья, давайте, братья, благодарим. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Let's pray. Can we pray? Yeah? Okay. You can stand if you want to stand. That's cool. God, we thank you so much for this time we got together. We thank you so much for your presence that is in this place. And I thank you, God, most importantly, most importantly, God, that you are here and you are the reason that we are here, God. And we thank you so much that when we gather in your name, you promise us that you are amidst and we thank you that your presence is here. We thank you that you are here. Holy Spirit, speak through me, take over me and reach our hearts with your word. Penetrate every, every place in our, in our life, in our heart, God, that has not been given unto you. And we just thank you so much that your word has the power to divide. And we thank you that your word has the power to bring forth fruit in our life, and we just open our hearts up, and right now, as we're praying, I just want you to begin to tell God, God, I open my heart to receive. I open my heart to hear from you. I didn't just come here to listen and to leave in, in one ear and out the other, but I want, God, you to speak to my heart. I want you, God, to speak into my life and what I'm going through right now in this season of my life, and I just thank you, God, so much that when we come with an open heart, God, you are faithful to speak to us, to touch us, to give us what we need in this season of our life, and we thank you, God, that you are more than faithful. And whenever we come to you, God, you always answer. You always speak. And we thank you, God, for your presence in this place. And we thank you, God, so much for what you're going to be speaking to us. And we thank you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in all of us. Have your way tonight. And we thank you so much, God, for your glory. And everybody said, amen. 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 Tell your neighbor, amen. 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 Okay. My message tonight, it's not my message, God's message tonight through me, is the gift is greater than the trespass. The gift is greater than the trespass. If you want to turn with me to Ephesians 2, 8 really quick, we're going to read this verse before I go into explaining what I'm talking about. The gift is greater than the trespass. Ephesians 2, 8. If you're there, tell me you're there. Is that it? Ephesians 2.8, okay. Sorry, can't wait for you that long. You need to really study your Bible if you're having a hard time finding Ephesians 2.8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Tell your neighbor, it is the gift of God. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the very gift of God. You know, if there is no gift, there is no talking about grace. Are you with me? If there is no gift and there is no grace, there is no need for faith. But there was a gift that was given. There was grace that was released. And now there is faith that we can have through which we are saved by. Anybody receive a gift before? Huh? Anybody? I want you to remember the best gift you have ever received in your childhood. Think right now. I didn't get anything, man. The best gift you have ever received in your childhood. All right, do you have it? Is it locked in? I don't think this is the best gift I've ever received, but I'm just going to say it anyway. This is probably the, one of the highlights of my childhood is when I believe I was 9 or 10, and I am by no means or was in my childhood a video gamer. I was outside killing bears and lions like David. It's a joke. I was outside playing sports and always active and climbing trees and doing stupid stuff outside with my brother. 
And, but I remember this one Christmas, maybe it was my birthday, but my birthday's around Christmas, so it was, doesn't matter. It was around that time, I think I was nine or 10, and I got, if you all remember, a Nintendo 64. <laughs> Nintendo 64, and with it came Donkey Kong and Super Mario Brothers. But you know what's funny? As you're thinking about your gift, as you are thinking about your gift, some time went by and this gift was no longer a gift, it was in the garbage. Yeah? Yeah? I don't know where my Nintendo 64 is. I don't think I knew where it was like a few years after my birthday when I got it. And think about a lot of gifts you receive, man, in the moment, it is the greatest thing that just hit your plate. But sooner or later, that gift is lost, broken, or you are moving on to the next thing. You know, that's what everybody is in a doing today. I'm not talking about you, but a lot of people. Is that there was a gift that was released, but that gift is really not that important right now. The gift of God greater than the trespass. You know, a trespass is some kind of criminal offense where you took something that wasn't yours, you went somewhere you shouldn't go to, you touched something you shouldn't have touched, and you broke, you broke, when it comes down to it, you broke the law. Anybody trespass anybody's property? Anybody? I live in Richfield. We got, people got guns and are not, they don't care about calling police and, or calling somebody to, you know, somebody's on my property, they just come out and take care of business on their own. So I live in Richfield. If you want to jack me, that's the wrong person. I'm, not, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to shoot you, but my neighbors will probably shoot you. So the, trespassing in Richfield is a no-go. But w- there was a trespass that was committed, but a gift of God that was released, and the gift of God was greater than any trespass that was ever committed. Okay? And we're going to go through, I want to go through some stories in the gospel it's like saying he's been studying the Gospels, and we're just going to help Slavic out. We're going to go through the Gospels, and we're going to talk about a lot of stories in the Gospels where we see Jesus. We see Jesus, who is the gift that I'm talking about, come face-to-face with a lot of trespass and come face-to-face with a lot of sin and come face-to-face with even the devil himself. But I want you to see how the gift is greater than the trespass. And I want you to begin to think in your life. What is the gift to you? Not my Super Nintendo when I received that when I was nine years old, but the gift, Jesus, that came into your life. What is that gift to you today? Was it like my Nintendo 64 or is it something else? We're going to start with the story of Matthew. I'm not going to be going to each place. There's a lot of stories I just want to bring up and go through quick. What's, what's incredible is that every writer, we have about 40 authors in the Bible, and every single one in some way or somehow is talking about this gift that is either coming or has come. And everybody, man, everybody in the Bible, you, 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 see, this, you see this line, we call it the red line that runs through the Bible where everybody's pointing to the gift. Everybody's pointing to Jesus, who he is, what he's going to do, how, how incredible he is. And I just want us to go into Matthew and just look, just look in Matthew just a little bit. We got 66 books in the Bible. We're just going to look to one book and what Jesus does when we see the gift compared to the trespass. Who likes math? Anybody, you know, the greater than sign? So if you're taking notes and you're naming this and, you're, and you want to, you know, you want something sweet or nice or cute for your, for your title, I want you to just put Jesus, the gift, greater sign than the trespass of man. Okay? You guys got it? Don't do it the other way because then it's less than. It doesn't work. My wife sent me a picture this week of her grades. Was it when you were in high school? I'm not picking on you, honey, don't worry. Uh, she sent me a picture of her grades. I think she was in high school or something. I personally love math. She does not like math. I was really good at math, and she was not good at math. And she sent me a picture of her classes in school, 
and like science and this and that and that, PE and art, some pre- and then some pretty hard classes. And she's got A's in all of them. And then she's got a C minus in, in math. And she sent, she's, she's like, man, I hate math. And she sent me it. But I personally love math. And uh, that's just my little testimony. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, I want to start with this. Jesus said in Matthew that I tell you the truth, that among those of women, among those that were born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than who? Jesus. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. John was not, he was born of a woman, but it's talking about something else. Then John the Baptist. I want you to listen to this one more time. This is Jesus' words. Later in Matthew, I think chapter 11. I tell you the truth, that among those born of women, there was not one that has risen that was greater, greater than John the Baptist. But you begin to see who John is and why he's alive and the things he says about Jesus and you begin to think, man, why is he the greatest? John the Baptist is known as the man in the Bible, the man that we all know that prepared the way for Jesus. John was a man that said, man, I'm not even worthy to untie or carry his sandals. John was the man that said, Less of me and more of him. May I dink, decrease that he may only increase in my life. John was the man that had the opportunity of baptizing the Son of God in the water. Come on, we, had just, we just had some people get baptized recently. John was the man that baptized Jesus in the water. I saw a pastor baptizing some people, and he just, you know, dunks them, and they like, come on, get baptized in the name of Jesus. And John was the man that baptized Jesus into the water. And John said, yo, I can't baptize you. You need to be baptized in me. Baptized in me. And Jesus said, no, this must be done to fulfill scripture. I need to be baptized. Baptize me right now. John's like, yes, sir. Boom, baptizes him. But you, you know, something interesting, John's the greatest. And what you see constantly in John's life is that Jesus is everything in his life. You know, John's life was devoted to being in the woods, in the desert area, preparing the way for Christ. John's, you could say, John's model of life was, man, less and less, and everybody's talking about me, everybody knows me, everyone's coming to me to hear me speak, but, yo, less of me and more of Jesus. More of Jesus. I think somebody that was the greatest understood the gift. Somebody who was called the greatest understood the value of the gift that was coming, and that was before him. John the Baptist, even in his mother's womb, jumped when Jesus walked in the room. Hello. Somebody had an encounter with the gift, and not just an encounter, but a revelation, a personal experience of what this gift is, who he is, how great he is, that every prophet for hundreds of years before him has been prophesying and talking and speaking forth about this Jesus. And now John is the man in... In his life, who is now facing Jesus, and not just facing Jesus and knowing Jesus, but preparing the way for him. Jesus' first encounter in Matthew. He is in temptation by Satan. Being tempted by Satan. We see... You know, Mayweather and Pacquiao went down not too long ago. The greatest fight of the century. This was the greatest thing right here that has ever happened on earth. Where the son of God comes to earth as a man and he's about to have a face off with the devil. The last time he had a face off with God was when he got cast down and he lost. And he's about to have a face off with his son. And we see the same result, that the gift is greater. The gift is greater. 
He tempts him in food. Tempts him in his power and authority. Jump off and see what happens. Tempts him in giving him everything he needs and wants. And Jesus says, the word, the word, the word. And it says, the devil, the devil. Turns around and leaves. We expected some kind of fight or battle. And all we see is Jesus speak a few words from the Bible. And Mr. Devil turns around and walks away. Because somebody greater came. Somebody greater came. Sometimes maybe you feel like you face the enemy. Do you know who's on your side? Do you know even farther than that who is inside of you? What is that noise? Satan, get behind me right now. He has a man come against him who's facing leprosy. The Pharisees at that time cast these kind of people out of the city. But now we see Jesus coming into a city and a man with leprosy is coming at him. Now, a man with leprosy, you don't touch. You don't even look at. You get away from. But this man's coming to Jesus and Jesus is coming up to him. I think at that moment, everybody's like, what is Jesus doing coming up to a man with leprosy? Don't, you don't touch these guys. You don't talk to them. These guys don't even live in the walls of the city. they got to live somewhere else because we don't want them to infect us. But we see Jesus in the beginning of Matthew coming in to contact with a guy who has leprosy. You know what Jesus says? The man asks, if you're willing, and I want to focus on this. He says, if you're able to heal me, heal me. You know what Jesus says? I am willing and I am able, be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed. So like I mentioned, the centurion's faith, probably the first time this has ever happened, where Jesus has an encounter with uh, a centurion, a, a guard of the army, a big man in the army, and he says, hey, the guy says, I know, hey, I know what authority is, I know what power is. I tell my servants to go, they go. I tell them to leave, they leave. I tell them to stay, they stay. Just say a word and, and I know what's going to happen. And just like Slag said, he says, man, that's the greatest faith I've ever seen. And Jesus doesn't even go on a hospital visit, doesn't even take a car or a horse over there to the, to the guy's house. He just says, hey, when you get back, he's going to be healed. There are some people that we're going to begin to see like this centurion who who begin to realize that, man, this, this is something greater that has arrived. This is something greater that's come into our country, something greater that we're having an encounter with, something that we've never seen before. And this something greater you've received in your life. Jesus crossing the, sto crossing the uh, sea with the, with the disciples. You guys remember this? Jesus is crossing the sea with the disciples. He's crossing a sea with the disciples, and they hit a storm. Disciples start freaking out. We're going we're gonna to die. We're going to die. We're going to die. And they're, they're waking him up. Somebody runs to his room. Do, do you even care about us? Wake up. We're going to die. There's a storm that's going to take over our boat. And he's like, what are you freaking out about? And he gets up. He gets up out of his room. Just, anybody get waking up from a nap? He, 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 he gets waking up from a nap and he goes on the, on the edge of the boat and he's like, be still and be quiet. And all of, a sudden it come, it, all of a sudden it becomes still and quiet and disciples are looking at themselves, who is he that he can even command the wind and the waves? But something greater showed up that even nature itself has to listen. Be still and be quiet. And they're freaking out. We see multiple encounters with the blind, the mute, and the deaf. And we see healing and healing and healing. We see him healing on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees in these moments are, are trying to find out who, who is healing on the Sabbath. Who is doing this on the Sabbath? Who has a right to do something on the Sabbath? Who can lift his hand to pick anything up on the Sabbath? Who can tell somebody to be healed and carry his mat out of the house on a Sabbath? But somebody greater than the Sabbath showed up. 
We actually have a, a chapter in the Bible that says, the Lord of the Sabbath. Somebody who can heal and can do what he did on Sabbath is the one who is greater than the Sabbath. And that was Jesus. A day that was set apart for the Jewish people to be holy and sanctified and set apart not to do any work. Jesus shows up. He doesn't break the law, but he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And he heals people and sets people free on that day. If some of you are not excited, you're going to get excited soon. We see Jesus coming into a new town. This, I hope this excites you. If it doesn't, the next one will. I see Jesus coming into a town. And this probably happened all the time, but something that was about to happen has never happened before. Jesus is coming into town, and as he's coming into a town, there's some people coming out of the town. And what the people are doing coming out of the town is it's a mother bearing her one and only child. And it says she's weeping, and she has all her friends and relatives there weeping and comforting her, and they're carrying the son out of the city. But just in that moment of time, I don't think this is a coincidence, Jesus just happens to be coming into the city. And he, he, he has been shown to do something. Remember, Jesus says, I, I don't do anything I've, I haven't seen. I don't do anything I haven't been told to do. And Jesus has been told to do something as he's coming into the city. And what he begins to do, some, some, somebody and nobody has ever done before. And he sees the woman, it says, and he comes up, to the, comes up to the coffin, touches the coffin, and he says, come alive. Be alive. Back to life. <laughs> and the boy rises. Somebody greater was coming in to the city. Somebody so great that even death coming out had to stop, check itself, and then be resurrected. Somebody greater was coming in, and he didn't pass by. You're still quiet. It's okay. We see, I want to mention a couple personal encounters. We see Jesus taking, getting, away from, getting away from his disciples and coming up to a well where a woman's coming to get water. And this woman's got a great thing that's been going wrong in her life over and over again. But we see Jesus come forth and then even people, people saying, what, people, coming up, people coming up later, what, what, why, why is he talking to her? How, how can he talk to her? Why is he, Jesus is sitting down with a woman, what? And people begin to look at him the way they are. Is we can't sit down with women. Because who knows what can happen. Or maybe they're unclean. We shouldn't be next to them. But somebody greater was coming up to a woman who had a great problem. And Jesus ministers to this woman. And serves her. And speaks into her life. And through this woman, she begins to spread the news in her town and city about this Jesus that knows everything about her. Okay, maybe this one, maybe this one looks at you. Jesus going to the house of sinners. Okay. Jesus going to the house of sinners. Now, the Pharisees, I want you to check this out. The Pharisees, how can he go to the house of sinners? How? How can a, a clean man, a righteous man, walk into a house of sinners? You see, all the Pharisees saw was their own righteousness and the way they look at people. And the way, the, the places they can be in and can't be in. But we see somebody for the first time. So great that he even begins to blow the minds of the religious people. You blow my mind. He blew their mind. He blew their mind when he is stepping in to the house of sinners. 
Somebody greater showed up and could step into this house and sit with these people and know they're not going to affect me. Because I think one of the Pharisees was thinking, man, these people are unclean, but, but I'm clean. And if I go into this place that's unclean, I'm going to become unclean. No, but Jesus was so clean that he could walk into the house and not worry about they're unclean and I'm clean and now I'm not going to be, be clean. No, I'm clean enough to be in the place where people are unclean and, and help them. Somebody greater showed up. Talked about, about this at Teens this week. There's a, a woman who got brought by these same Pharisees in a crowd of people. And this is a moment where Jesus is teaching, and he's sitting down and teaching everybody, and he gets rudely interrupted by these Pharisees, and they come, they come, they come in, and they say, you know, Alex is a buff guy. This, this woman, this woman, and he puts, he puts her, he, they do this, because this is what they, this is what they like to do. He, they put her in the middle, and they say, this woman, this woman right here, this buff, tall woman right here, got caught in the act of adultery. Now, it, it's one thing to be talked about or have rumors about, but this woman got caught in the act of adultery. Caught. Hello, you been, ever been caught doing something? <laughs> she got caught in the act of adultery. Tell your neighbor, caught. She got caught in the act of adultery. And they say this, look, what they said is what's written. They said, this woman got caught and what the Bible tells us to do, the Torah, the, 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 the commandments, the law, this is what it tells us to do. This woman needs to be stoned. And Jesus is sitting, teaching, and now he's quiet and he's looking down, pointing, and writing something in the sand. Sit down, beautiful woman. Thank you. Jesus, whoever has the first throne, please throw it. Anybody, first stone, throw it. If you have not sinned, throw that first stone. And he just keeps his head down, he's drawing. And he looks up. Woman, where, where are those that are accusing you? They're, they're, not, they're not here. I, I don't accuse you or condemn you either. Go in, sin no more. But wait, 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 wait. This woman got caught in the act of adultery. According to the law, she needs to be stoned. What is he doing? What is he doing? They're right. She needs to be stoned. You know, you don't get it yet. This, this is going to make you shout. <laughs> Somebody greater showed up. And he's so great that he had the power to say, be free. But wait, she committed sin. She committed sin. And the Bible says all sin deserves death. You do something wrong, something right needs to be done. You break the law, we need to fulfill it. She broke sin, and know what happens. She goes because he stays. Somebody greater, somebody greater came. Somebody greater came. And he didn't just have beautiful words to say. But... Yeah, she got caught, but let me tell you what really happened. No, he just said, go. And he stood there himself. Because somebody greater showed up. Somebody greater than the sin that she committed showed up. And not just greater, somebody who was so great that that sin that needs to be punished for, he says, I will stand here. And this sin, I'm soon going to take punishment for. But you can go just sin no more. The cross. His next victories, there are many victories, but his next ones before his time on earth was done was conquering the cross, dying on the cross, conquering the grave, conquering sin, conquering hell, and conquering Satan.
when John wanted to make sure that the greater thing showed up, he sent some guys to ask Jesus a question. And all Jesus said back is this. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Somebody greater showed up. And that's all John needed to hear. Because nobody, 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 nobody has ever showed up and begun to do these things. But somebody greater showed up. And John just needed to hear before he died what he's doing. Can you imagine the feeling that John had when he heard those words before his head got chopped off? That I prepared, I prepared the way for him. And now he's healing them and setting people free. Deaf are hearing. The mute are speaking. The blind are seeing. Dead are being raised. The poor are being helped. That my work was not in vain. Now, there's a story. There's a story I want to share about a painting before we close. There was a very wealthy man. There was a very, very wealthy man who collected paintings. His wife had passed away, but he himself was a big collector, a wealthy man, collected paintings, loved paintings. If I knew the paintings that, if I, if I told you the paintings of people he collected, you know, most of you know them, I go to school. He connected these, connected very, very, very expensive paintings a long time ago. And his son began to collect these paintings with him. But then war came into our country and the son had to leave for war. Son leaves for war, leaves for war and the father is waiting for his son to return because the father is really all he has left is this son. And he's waiting for the son to return back, to, to return back from war. He's waiting and waiting, no, no telegram, no, no postcards, no calls. He's waiting and waiting and finally there's a knock on his door and there's a soldier standing there all, all geared up. And he says, are you so-and-so? And he says, yes. He says, your son, you know, I have, I have the, the privilege of, not the privilege, I've been sent to tell you that your son died at war. And your son died, he, he died saving me. And the only reason I'm here is because when we were getting attacked, he actually grabbed me and pulled me out and him, him, he himself got killed, but I survived. And he said, I want to give you something. Your son told us many stories of how you love to collect paintings and you love, you love collecting all kinds of artwork. And I, I'm not an artist myself. <laughs> I'm not an artist, but I, I drew something and it was that moment that your son was pulling me out and saving me. And I drew it for you. And he gives him this, gives him this, uh, this portrait wrapped and this father unwraps it and looks at it and begins to cry. Just a simple photograph of this guy holding him on his back and carrying him out. This father ends up passing away. After that moment, crushed, lost his son, father ends up passing away later. Tells, tells his close friend, lawyer, that I wanna auction all this stuff off. I don't, I don't need it, I'm, I'm gonna die and when, I, when he's dead, I'm gonna auction all this stuff off and they have this big auction. People from all, all around the world, some of the biggest museums, art collectors, they all gather because this is about to be the biggest auction of precious, precious artwork and things that this man has collected, probably the biggest. And these people show up to have a chance to buy some of this artwork that he's been holding on to for so long. And the auction starts, and the first painting is this painting of this soldier, his son, carrying this, carrying this guy he saved who came to his house. That's the first painting on the auction. 
And he told him, he told him in his will, I want you to auction this one off first. And they auction it off and they say, okay. They put it up, they stand it up and everybody starts yelling. What is that? That is obviously not painted by anybody we know. That is low level of painting and artwork and why, let's, let's put that one aside and get to the good stuff. And everyone's screaming and mad and why? Why, why is this being sold? What, what is this? We don't even know who did this. We, he names the name of the soldier who drew this and they're like, who's that guy? We don't know, nobody wants us. He says, we have to sell this one first. We have to sell this one first of the sun and then we'll get to the rest. Everyone's mad, upset, whatever, laughing at it, pointing at it, making jokes about it. He says, let's start the bid at $100. Nobody's raising their hands. Please, let's start the bid at $100 for the painting of the soldier. Anybody? No hands are going up. He says it again, no hands go up. He says it one more time, and in the back, a man stands up. And he says, I, I was the friend of the father, and I knew this son who the painting, painting is of. But I'm not a wealthy man. All I have is $10. I'll buy it. The guy says, $10 bid, anybody going higher? $10 bid, anybody going higher? $10 bid, going once, going twice, sold for $10. And as soon as it was sold, the auctioneer says, the auction is announced to be over. And everybody starts foaming out of the mouth. What is this? We deserve an explanation. We came here for this auction. What are you talking about? And the father said, continuing his will, and this auctioneer reads it. In his will it says that whoever buys the photograph of my son takes everything. And the man in the back stood there with his jaw dropped. Who won everything because he bought the son. Now, see, something greater came. And some people began to see that this is really something greater. Don't even go to my house. Just say that he is healed, and I know he's going to be healed. Somebody who had authority to come into the house of sinners. Somebody who had authority to say, be, be forgiven, be free, be healed. Somebody greater showed up. And today, today, this gift for people becomes a laughing stock. Why, why do we need this? I can have that. That's what I want to bid on. That's what I want to win. That's why I came here. That's why I live. It's to, it's to have this. Why do I need the portrait of the son? But the father said that who has the son gets everything. And you know, God works the same way. One preacher said that when Jesus was being tempted on the mountain, is that he was offered everything if he worships him. And this preacher said that God does not work like that. He has offered us everything and then says, worship me. He does not force us to worship and tell us we'll get something. He says, I give you everything. I have given you everything. Worship me. How precious is that painting to you? How precious is that painting to you? Is he greater in your life? Is he really greater in your life? Or has he become a less than? Because there's some, there's some other things that, you know, I want more. I need more. More important. But for some people, he was always, and it will, and it will always be, the greatest thing that has ever come on this earth. The greatest thing that faced every problem we see and face ourselves. The greatest thing. And this greatest thing, I, I gave you a drop. I gave you an unworthy drop of who he really is. I gave you a low level of bad preaching 
of who he is. It was my first time up here. That's how bad I talked about who he really is. A drop. A drop of the things he faced and was greater than. And everything you face in your life, everything you face in your life, just because you lose or see defeat in your life, doesn't mean he's not greater. It doesn't mean he didn't win. It means you're still in your process of getting to know how great he is, getting to know who he is, what he can do, and beginning to yourself live in that greatness. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe we live in a time and we're going to see this more and more, where just like this illustration of this art gallery, art auction, is going to be real life. Who needs, who needs this painting? What is it worth? The Bible says that for those that believed, it became the power of God. But for those that didn't understand, it's foolishness. It's foolishness. And for everybody, this painting was foolishness. What is it worth? Who did, who did this? Why? But for those that understand and know, it is the very power of God in our life. It is the reason I have a greater sign facing me and I can overcome everything that comes out my way. It's the reason I have victory. It's the reason I got a smile on my face when everybody's, everybody's downcast and sad. It's the reason I have joy. It's the reason I have what I have. It's because there is a greater sign that's facing my way and it's not because of me. It's because I know the one who's the greatest. Let's pray. You know, I want to, as I'm reading this scripture, I want you to analyze your life, analyze your heart. We don't preach, we don't preach to hear wows, we don't preach to hear amens, we preach that people respond to the word of God, respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing. And to come to God as you are. And as I read this very, very powerful scripture in Colossians, if I was speaking, if, if, if the Holy Spirit is touching you in any way, if God's been speaking to your heart, maybe you are one of those people at that auction who have forsaken the gift for other things. Maybe you need to rededicate your life to Jesus. Maybe you're giving your life to Jesus for the first time. But this altar is going to be open for anybody that wants to come forward. Anybody wants to come forward and just receive this gift that is greater than any trespass you yourself have ever committed. No matter what you've done, tonight you saw that everything Jesus faced, he was greater than. He overcame. We see victory. We see that he breaks this new way out, that he makes a way for us to heaven. And I want you not to be scared of where you're at, thinking, man, I'm not going to make it. Man, this thing's not going to go away in my life. I've messed up. No. The gift is greater than any mistake you've ever made. The gift is greater than anything you have ever faced or will face in your life. The gift is greater. And we are saved by grace through faith and it is all because of the gift. And tonight, if you need to receive the gift, as I'm reading this passage, I want you to come forward, not afraid, but running to God, saying, God, I need this gift. And I want this gift. And I want this gift to become greater in my life as it did in John's. I want this gift to become greater in my life. He is the image of the invisible God. Come on, if I'm speaking to you, I want you to come forward. The firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Come on, God's touching your heart. I want you to come forward. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. 
He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace. Through his blood shed on the cross. We were alienated from God and were enemies in our minds because of our evil behavior. But he has reconciled us by Christ's physical body to present us holy in his sight without blemish and free of accusation. God, we thank you for your victory, not just in your life, but the victory we see on the cross, the victory that we see for our sin, the victory over death, the victory over hell, the victory over Satan. We thank you, Jesus, for your victory. We thank you, Jesus, that in everything you faced, everywhere you went, every person you met, that you were greater. You were greater. You were greater. You were greater. And I thank you, God. I thank you, God, that if we have you, we got everything, God. That if we have you, we have everything, God. That you presented your son as a gift. And those that receive this gift, receive everything they need. We are not those that's waiting, that are waiting for something better. That's waiting for the next, next piece of artwork. But we are those that want to receive and accept the gift in our life, that want to pursue this gift in our life, that want this gift to become everything, this gift to consume us, this gift to mean everything to us, this gift to be great in our life. We want to experience and know the greatness of this gift. One voice to a God we lift up one song. 